All right, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Bay Area Lisbon Scheme Meetup. Um, we are ha we're ha having a plethora of speakers. We're very excited uh, today to have Daniel Kluss here to speak about uh, his investigations of Alan Kay's work at the Viewpoint Viewpoints Research Institute. Um, so Daniel's not related to them in any way, but has done a lot of studying of their work. And they did a very interesting project, which uh, mm -hmm. Daniel will talk about in great detail, I think. Uh, entirely too much detail. Entirely too much detail, yeah, yeah. and maybe we'll even get to hear about A6 and FPGAs at the end. Oh yeah, a little bit. Yeah. Did you did you go through the slides? I did very quickly. All right, thanks. So, so thank you for asking that Ron? question. Yeah. All thanks, right, thanks, I'm thanks. just going to turn it over to Daniel and turn off my microphone. All right. So I want to encourage everybody to go to Viewpoints Research Institute, um, vpri.org. Um, you can actually read their papers uh, there. I took as many screenshots as I could to sort of keep the original stuff intact. And I put way too many slides in here with the hope that you would miss what's on the slides and go read the papers. And uh, I need to admit people. So please forgive me for doing that. It was intentional. Um, I uh, started off uh, looking at, uh, they had a, an, an NSF grant uh, to do this. It's a five-year project. and. This is from their, their first one. I actually go in chronological order, sort of give some ideas. So 2007, if you remember where you were then, I, however, don't. Um, these are some of the, uh, the wonderful people. And they actually added to their group as time went on. You might see names up there of people you recognize or even faces. Um, study it carefully. There will be a test later. Uh, so their primary goal was to do all of human interaction with computing uh, in 20,000 lines of code, or just the, the, the general high-level stuff, you know, if you would. And for comparison, some Windows and Linux things are in the millions. Um, there's other code bases that are even you know, considerably larger. And so imagine doing something in 20,000 lines of code, how very, very little you'd possibly get done, or how much more you have to be brief to do it. And uh, this was uh, sort of what they were trying to do. Um, they had a lot of these, uh, these high-level ideas here. They, they really liked objects a lot. There's some object-oriented people in there. And they, they, they liked this sort of taking the, the electrical engineering side and, and scaling it up all the way to having a, a usable viewing system. But there's a lot of parts in the middle here that just gobble up lines of code. Uh, yeah. When they embarked on it, it might have been a, a little bit ambitious, but they they kind of got a lot of there. And I'll go through and show you some of what that is. I'm assuming you guys are reading off the screen, so I won't do that to you. One of the things they really liked to do was translate things to other things. Um, that was probably their biggest, uh, I don't know, line-saving operation is they would take as high of a level language as they could, something written in math, something, uh, some kind of parser, things along those lines, and they'd translate it and translate it and eventually go and put it onto a computer. And this was their sort of thesis of everything, if you would. This is, uh, I won't say a lot about it because the picture speaks for itself, but no. <laughs> So JIT, just in time, Blit, which is, uh, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it's putting uh, sort of two-dimensional graphics together, blending them in, doing things along those lines. Uh, it's, it's very, very, to make this, they used very, very surprisingly little code, and then they translated it into a lot of other things. It's a sort of a, a thing that they do is they, they make a lot of artistic sort of things. I'm, I'm hoping that some of this will get stuck in your head and you'll go look it up. This right here is what happens when you've got vector graphics and then you do the same sort of thing, you mix it with JITblit. But I don't know if you know how fast a Pentium M was way back when. They've got it running at 10 frames per second. This is a single core way, way back when. This is blazingly fast. Also, you know, painfully slow, but it's actually anti-aliased and pixel perfect at that. 
I don't know, it's, it'd be a difficult thing for anybody to do today. This is before GPUs were used really for much anything. This is the actual math that they used. They, they didn't do uh, code much. In fact, they tried to do as much of this kind of stuff as they could and then throw it into a parser, throw it into a thing to translate to another language and another, and eventually assembly, and then spit it out. This is the thing that actually, they go and compute the, uh, the sum of the coverage to actually get pixel perfect uh, for all the edges, which is something you are not gonna find today a lot in vector graphics even. And so they, they start bringing it up into a higher level and they're like, okay, let's, let's render workspaces, but we'll do a workspace and a workspace and just have uh, I don't know, transformations and sort of higher level things to make it so you can do an anything on an anything. And, and this is just as live as this. And, and they have a bad habit of doing that again and again. So they're trying to get sort of a lot of, uh, I guess, heavy lifting done for light work. This right here is a uh, proper TCP IP um, thing. And it actually works and it's very, very small. And I, I put it on the screen just so you could actually see how small it is. And I don't expect you to read it, but it's very few lines of code if you would agree with me there. And, and it works and it's correct. This is what it looks like in a, an RFC. There's a bunch of these kind of uh, ASCII art diagrams. They're a lot of fun to look at. And then some human generally goes and writes some C or this or that or the other. And they reference it, you know, and they type it out, they get it wrong, they make mistakes. What this is the grammar that parses it and turns it on this side of things that are recognized is parsing expression grammar into uh, this side, which is something called semantic actins. And by being able to assign actions at the same time to things that you can recognize, you actually get a complete uh, interpreter more, more or less for free. And if you have actions on, on that side and you have say assembly language on this, you get a compiler. Again, damn near for free, fits on a page. And it works and it's correct. It's the correct part that's the most interesting is you cannot get an incorrect thing of that using that. This is that actual tool called Ometa. This is uh, just a sort of a very simple line of it just to show, hey, look, we're trying to add some things and this is the semantic action over here. And uh, they sort of went between infix and postfix and lispy and not super important. It's just that they could make a thing for JavaScript and Smalltalk and Logo, parse, everything. Even Ometa has a really, really brief thing to parse itself. These are small, small numbers, lines of code. Uh, somewhere else I read in their thing, they had done as many as 60 different languages that they just, when it takes a few hundred lines of code, maybe a few minutes to a day to write a parser for something, and the parser is also an interpreter because it has semantic actions, and it's also a compiler, it, it kind of makes language a lot more fun. And, and I think that's something that, you know, the Lisp people really, really <laughs> appreciate. And uh, they use JavaScript a lot for examples because it runs in browsers. They really like to extend JavaScript. And so there's a lot of things where they extended it with worlds, with uh, different, I don't know what you would call them, different things that are certainly not grammatically correct in normal JavaScript and wouldn't run. And they actually just translate them into correct JavaScript that does run. And so it's, it's sort of like how TypeScript is today, how it's a superset of JavaScript. They would make supersets of supersets of supersets and like iteration cycles that are days. Like the actual power that they had to do all this was amazing. Oops, let me see if I went backward forward, okay. There's some papers specifically on Ometa uh, on vpri.org, which I would highly encourage people to read. Um, making it from the paper directly in whatever your, your pet language may be is fast and it's short. I mean, 40 lines of code for, for one particular language, but maybe 30, 50, 100 for others. Um, Omed has been made uh, in C-sharp, 
I think they had Python. I know I've seen JavaScript a lot, but uh, oh, I saw a Java one. But they, they made it for all sorts of different ones. And um, yeah, it would just be a good one. Alex Worth specifically uh, has put a lot of effort into it. And I, I think uh, he's still doing stuff in the language space today. Be a great guy to look up. This is, uh, they're trying to make uh, a lot of uh, user interface stuff back then sort of really early in their five-year process. They would just make a bunch of widgets, throw them together, make them work and do things. And they, you could actually take them all apart and put them back together again in, in amazing ways. It was just amazing. And these, these titles of these pages are specifically the parts in the, page, in the papers to look at. That's why I put them in there. And my hope is that you might see something that'll encourage you to go read more about it. They were prolific. <laughs> they, uh, they like to put things in, in this sort of form too. Children really like to use these a lot. Um, they're sort of a, a bridge between low code, no code kind of things, uh, and then sort of block programming. And it's, a, it's something that you can translate into and out of very, very quickly. Um, they worked a lot on early childhood education. This is sort of one of those examples. They liked to try to have larger uh, things from physics. And this is an example of trying to use the idea of every single letter having uh, its own attraction and repulsion, and then things at the scale of words having their own attraction and repulsion, and using it for typesetting, which is kind of weird. But if they did this nowadays and put that in a vertex shader on a GPU, it would be insanely fast. Not that it, it was real time back then when they were playing with it. This is them literally just dragging around. But it's, it's just such a different way of thinking. Nobody would be like, oh, I'm going to go do particle physics to do typesetting, because why not? But the math for it is so much shorter. And if you've ever done any typesetting, you would know how much a pain in the ass it is to do that in a performant way. And they kind of liked FPGAs a lot, and they'll come up a lot. I don't know if anybody knows what FPGAs are, if you could raise your hand. Oh, wow. Okay, we'll have to talk about FPGAs more sometime. Anybody who doesn't know that might have, okay. So it's a field programmable gate array, uh, which doesn't say a lot, but it's the equivalent of a an electrical engineer or a programmer or somebody can make schematics and you take those schematic level designs of say AND gates and OR gates, things like that, and it'll uh, simulate, is maybe the wrong word for it, quickly what that would look like in a real system, um, oftentimes at hundreds of megahertz. And sometimes they have as many as thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds, or even millions of, of these gates and they've got a bunch of other things in there that are really fun, but an FPGA is oftentimes used to prototype what become you know, chips down the road, maybe CPUs, GPUs, switches, routers, whatever the things might be. These are oftentimes prototyping things for making what we have today as computers uh, and, and every other chip thing that's awesome. Um, they're entirely too much fun and I would encourage <laughs> to go look at them. But 100 lines of code, and I'll show you what the thing is that they made. What are the links between the chips and this? Well, so the link is that when, uh, when you're doing software development, you're always targeting some kind of CPU at the end of the day. If you have the opportunity to target the gates specifically, you can actually mold what would be the CPU into something that will more you know, be more suitable for your software that you're making. Because something that they'll come up with a lot is um, optimization problems. Because they're not writing specifically, you haven't seen really much of anything for special data structures or algorithms or anything else. Certainly no micro-optimizations, cache, things like that. They avoided optimization like the plague so they could keep the code short and, and trivially correct so they can read it. And because of that, they needed to have a special way to have access to make the CPU be more amenable to that. And so this is, this is how you would, 
make a CPU is with an FPGA. And if you had uh, a large enough run that you would want, you'd go make a bunch of ASIC, you know, custom chips out of it. And so this is sort of that problem is they want to do that electrical engineering all the way up to the stuff on the screen. And this is, this is that electrical engineering part. But it's that, that really tininess that's, that's really cool to see because this right here is a CPU. Kind of. <laughs> yeah, kind of. But it is. It's got a program counter, some registers. It, it's a CPU. And they, they made it so that it would be a very, very simple thing to describe so that the target grammar to translate things into would be able to run on it quickly. How, how close is it to a CPU? That we, how close is this to a CPU? So um, how close is this to a CPU that is commonly used today? A million miles away. This is, uh, it's, it's... actually very close. Modern CPUs also have registers. They have program counters. <laughs> they have memory. They have uh, our units. So it's pretty close. It's just very different because that's how they used to do CPUs by 40 years ago. It was much easier. Oh, yeah. Now like modern stuff is much more complex, but the ideas are the same. Why PC plus two? Program counter plus two. Um, you know what? I would I would have to ask them why they want the program counter being incremented by one or two. I think it's because they have different size instructions. So it's not uh, a, a reduced instruction set where all the instructions are the same size. And so they might have multi-word instructions. That would be my guess, but they have sort of two bits of those, but they don't have plus four. Could be conditional uh, skip instructions. So if oh, I, see. I would encourage you to read it. It's a whole hundred lines long. <laughs> I hope it doesn't take up too much time for somebody. But that's that's the sort of joy of it is that there's probably more descriptive language in this picture than the hundred lines that actually make it. I think eventually we talked about this about schematics, mm -hmm. but actually Verilog is really like this higher level the register transfer level description. It, it, it so is. Like, you've ever seen like ISPS, that old language they use to describe an ISA and simulate it? Well, Verilog, you can actually synthesize the, the hardware from it. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Verilog and VHDL and System C and a lot of other things that these are made out of are a good deal less painful than schematics like this specifically. Um, and the schematics that they end up turning into are generally automatically generated and they get synthesized down into gate logic and, but. But this is much more visual. Oh yeah. Yeah. And um, it's a sort of dealer's choice on, on what people actually like to work. And there's some, some people that are sitting there laying out the wires that go on the mask. And there's other people that are, you know, very, very at the high level. Um, but it's a dipping your toes into electrical engineering. This is a really great way with FPGAs and small examples. Um, this right here is sort of how they wanted uh, it to sort of be as a sort of a systematic structure. They're really interested oftentimes in running things in browsers, and that's why the JavaScript, but they also had things running on their own systems that were developed in so many languages, it's hard to remember them all. It was a very ambitious product. I uh, skipped a year, um, mostly because 2008 didn't have a lot. I don't know why. It's 2009, they were making some good progress. And the, the thing that I liked is the Maxwell's equations of, well, whatever this is, computing. But having something that would fit on a t-shirt, because a lot of their things, you know, 100 lines here, 50 lines there, you could have a t-shirt that described some of these things that are, if you go look for, you know, for, for TCP IP, it's a million miles long in, in Linux. You go look at uh, the, the rendering libraries, the file system, the, any of these things, they're, they're just a millions and, well, hundreds of thousands or millions of lines long. They're so incredibly long. They want to include the word processor, spreadsheet, printing, web, browsers, and emails, everything. But they were getting there. And I do mean t-shirts. <laughs> this is from their thing. I, I love the way they were with graphics. 
But a few hundred t-shirts compared to tens of millions of lines of pages of code. I don't know. Sounds nice. And uh, just so you know, everything in, in, in all these slides, just, just pictures from their, their reports. And they've got many more than that. They focused a lot on math. And they really, really separated the meaning from the optimization. That was something that you'll see again and again. Um, they had a lot of pain with optimization. Um, later on, it'll talk more about what that was. But they were able to very tersely describe things and oftentimes be able to have them short enough that they're correct or have parsers from the specifications to, to have a, a good, say, chain of custody for correctness. This right here is sort of the building block of what they did. And they love their parsing expression grammars, those uh, semantic action things. But you can take in something and output something and take it in and output it. It's the way they built everything. Well, what does it mean, the difference between meaning and logic? Can you, can you speak up some? Uh, what does it mean, the difference between meaning and logic? Oh, so meaning would be something along the lines of uh, an equation that describes something, um, I don't know, so something that's just got a, a human readable description that's, that's brief and short. Oftentimes when there's logic or state machines or algorithms and data structures, things like that, I, make, I, I could tell anybody in a half a second, hey, here's a pile of things, can you sort them by length? And anybody in here not ever knowing any sorting algorithm at all, we'll just sort them really fast. You don't know any special data structures or anything. There's that, that meaning side is what, what we sort of, it's the, the human part. That's what they wanted. Is it like intent? Intent, yeah. Yeah, they actually, they talk a lot about intent too. Um, they, they sort of really go down the rabbit hole of being able to have a, a very self-descriptive uh, system where the math is obvious, the meaning's obvious, the intent, and, and, and folding that into higher level abstractions. They just love the higher level abstractions. They were trying to get to a point where, I don't know if you've ever seen SQL some, and you can write fairly brief things and get kind of complicated and everything, but if you ever looked at the operations that the database has to do to make that happen, it's piles of insanity. <laughs> it is it, it has to be some sort of a bijection that's what these things are for is is, is taking some sort of meaning level thing on on one side and, and taking something that's a bit more more concretely implemented on the other side and uh, some of their work is actually taking concrete implementations and pulling them into the more meaningful space they they want to have bijection as much as possible um Oh, I'll show you some on, on some, some further slides. It's actually the next slide. <laughs> this is uh, chaining them together. And so they would take uh, source code, uh, pick your favorite source code, because they didn't have favorites, apparently. Um, and it would turn it into an abstract syntax tree, which is uh, sort of like a, a nested uh, thing of like, so you've got a function, and then a for loop, and then an if, and then you shouldn't nest that deeply. but people do and it they can take a, a source to source is the wrong word it's uh, graph to graph maybe but it's it's sort of do small steps and and do, make minor improvements and, and you can keep those minor improvements around and say this pipeline got to be you know 100 chunks long it's okay these are individual passes that you'll sometimes see in uh, compilers this is a very normal sort of chain of a compiler. It, eh. Compilers are a lot more complex nowadays, but it is. But they they tried to do things where it would be equivalent to a transducer, but just having something come in and come out and being able to to sort of watch that path. Oh, a transducer is a uh, uh, it's something uh, at least. Uh, that is used in languages a lot where you might take uh, like entire blocks of words that you can recognize and then 
say mark them up to some other kind of thing or like say oh this is always a verb this is a noun and or sometimes they'll use them for other languages or but it's a it's a way to have some action taken as there's things that are parsed and for this instead of semantic actions they oftentimes would output symbology uh, and make graphs out of it but uh I can explain some more, um, or maybe we'll talk about it a little bit more. Um, the year four, huh? I'm trying to remember what they were doing just then. Some more slides on it. What they started doing was really focusing a lot more on getting some optimization out of it. So. They were outputting to assembler, so there isn't some, you know, say C compiler or other thing in the way. It's really, really first principles kind of thing, uh, even to the point of, hey, we don't need your CPU; we'll just make our own. And they started putting more of these sort of things in the middle, and that sort of led to some things down the road we'll talk about. But this was the sort of be-all, end-all, and so far as I can tell, the best state of the research that I could find is this sort of process. It's amazingly brief, it's powerful, and it doesn't limit what your optimization is. Um, but at the same time, it's, it's a very different way of doing things. It is, it's entirely parsing expression grammars all the way down, like turtles all the way down. It's Instead of, so does anybody know what a tokenizer is? A lexer, things along those lines, okay. So parsing expression grammars don't need that. They're the, the tokenizer, the lexer, uh, and I'm sure you guys know like, you know, as assemblers and all those things, they would oftentimes not even put, out, put assembly, they'd put out the binary. It's, uh, if I could say, the best possible thing that a person could really learn if, if they were just gonna spend all, all the time in the world on it is these. So it gives you like a tool set to go after languages by the dozen and, and problems and new domain specific languages. And it's, this is the magic if there is one. Can you have an example for example, if we have a text like, I, I like this chair and like what, what happens to the text on um, so there's some examples in the Ometa papers. I would I would recommend you read them. Um, I don't think there's any examples in the slides that that show a lot about that, but the Ometa papers do. Um, this is sort of the idea is to give you a teaser to not give you any actual answers. It's their fifth year, and they they started saying this sort of stuff a lot, like a thousandth the amount of code. Um, instead of really sort of focusing on that that 20,000 lines of code, because at this point there are too many tens of thousands of lines of code to really think they can do 20,000. But they're, they're still getting those kind of amazing wins. And having some of these things being readable, uh, like thoroughly readable in, in a lot less is, is nice. And just for some context, today you can go ask ChatGPT to summarize things um, and you can also say hey given this sort of like short little snippet go make me a thing that's not what this is this is actual like pure symbolic logic math all the things that are like actual and real this does it the 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 short like synopsis that you get that grows into implementation is is proper the whole entire way through and the things where they actually go and pull that in reverse, those are proper all the way through. They're not a best guess, a, a fuzzy, a maybe. It's, it's the, this is the real version of it. You know, a good, I don't know, decade ago. What, what's the link between a token in the GPT AI models? What's the link between a token and this model? So um, a token in chat GPT uh, is just sort of like a separated word. Uh, they do individual spaces, I hear, as tokens, which is kind of evil. But um, uh, because uh, indention and things like Python end up adding a lot of tokens. Um, with this is, it recognizes individual characters 
and then you can have a rule that recognizes words and you can have rules that recognize multiple rules and the rules are parameterizable. Um, and so you get a, a whole hierarchy of what a, a, a say a token might be, um, even to the point of uh, they'll recognize entire like tree diagrams and, and go through and, and match on, on shapes of things. And so it's a, it's a large generalization similar to how a graph versus a hypergraph might be. Um, that would be a good thing to ask Wolfram. He and 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 I would uh, say is the the was it the new physics? What was it called? Anybody remember Wolfram Alpha? New, well, science. new science, yeah, a new kind of science. NKS. Read NKS, and you'll get into hypergraphs entirely too much, and you'll never use a regular graph ever again. By the way, you're talking about Wolfram and GPT in the same sentence. Yeah. He recently wrote a book. Uh, I think it's that title that I, I read it a few weeks ago. Like how G Chat GPT works. Nice. And, and it's, it's, it's actually nice because you know it's it's you don't have to be an expert in machine learning to understand it. It's you know written in a sort of the language that an ordinary you know scientifically literate layman could read. <laughs> I'm really interested in reading it. Uh, would anybody like to give a talk on it at some point? Volunteers? Volunteer? No? Okay. This, this, is, this, is a, this is a list group. Oh, I, I, okay. Actually, if, I, if, I, if I give a talk here, I have another topic in mind. Okay. More relevant to what I'm talking about today. Okay. Well, I, I'd, I'd love to learn more about it whenever, uh, whenever that's possible. <laughs> ah, okay. Yeah, my own medicine. It hurts. <laughs> Nice. Well, thank you. I would love it. Um, yeah, it's called What is Chat GPT Doing? So, what is Chat GPT doing? Uh, somebody's going to look at a uh, talk on that. I'd love it. Um, so, this is the fifth year. Okay. So, they've got a five year grant. So, they're, they're, they're sort of sort of looking at, you know, what are we actually going to get done here? And they're sort of going back and forth a little bit. But if, if you look at it, they're like, but we could have added some optimizations and made it run faster. And, and they're, they're, they're sort of going back and forth a little bit about it. I don't know if you guys got a chance to read it. If you didn't, let me know. So I wanted you to read it real quick. I, I won't read for you because I'm bad at that. That's okay. Mine aren't either. No, no, it's not out of focus. Uh, it's uh, scaled up from a PDF. Yeah. So it's, uh, it's blurred. Oh, yes. Yes, it's a four megabyte PDF, unfortunately. But the original PDFs are PDFs. <laughs> um, I'm gonna move on. So what they started doing is they put a lot more work into trying to get some low level things, but they're, they're like, but they're code eating. They're just, they're gobbling up piles and piles of, of uh, these little layers in between to do these optimizations and keyhole optimizations and big massive optimizations. And it's starting to be a, a thing where they're spending a lot more time on it. And it's the optimization power of Babel. Like it's, it's getting awful. And they are sort of spending a lot of time on it because they want it to run properly on a laptop, these graphic examples and all these different things that are super duper short and brief and terse. But again, this is hardware that's 10 years ago and they don't really have those options to you know, have like GPUs and multiple cores and you know, eight, 16, whatever. And, and they're filling the pain on it and they're at you know, near the end of their, their process. So then it's their final report. And this is sort of where it goes from there.
is probably the best little summarization right here is, is that this part of the design and optimization fought some of our original goals. <laughs> Yeah, so um, what they're trying to do is is put all of that human interaction of the web browsers and everything all the way down to the CPU level in like stuff that would fit on a t-shirt. Like this is the t-shirt of uh, vector graphics and this is the one of TCP. Oh, yeah, it's the whole system. Oh yeah, no, no, this was hugely ambitious. Don't get me wrong. And it's a thought experiment that got granted money and they worked on it for five years. <laughs> the huge amount of progress, like, yeah, like, like, like mind bogglingly amazing stuff. And the, the terseness was there, the performance wasn't. Okay, now we've gone a whole decade, the performance has gotten somewhere further. Um, and, and some of these papers uh, with their vector graphics, they translated that into, uh, into shader language. And it goes massively fast and super duper parallel and awesome. As they started, uh, the, G the FPGAs got way bigger in the last 10 years. The amount of cores got so much faster. They could probably do a lot of this today, real time. I mean, they were close to real time a decade ago. And I think building things this way would actually be amazing. The, they're, they're sort of filling it though, is, is that they're trying to harness the CPUs and they, they're trying to get the controls and features, but there's just a lot of tricky cases and they can't handle them in interpreters and they can't get the various kinds of optimizations that they want. They, they, they had to generate really decent machine code but I don't know if you've ever seen like a just-in-time compiler or, or anything like that. Uh, has anybody seen the, the source code of V8 that, that runs JavaScript? Yeah, yeah I, I have. <laughs> None of this is really surprising. No. <laughs> when, when you look at the like, compiler architecture, for example, I mean, basically, they're using this simple syntax-directed tree transition. Mm -hmm. but token. They start with tokens, and at some point they they move to traits. But it's mm -hmm. it's it's just rewriting, uh, local rewriting. A lot of local. And, and if, if you look at what real compilers do to produce optimized code, uh, they're highly non-local analyses that are performed, and, and and you simply just can't well, not express only. those at least in any straightforward, sensible way. And that kind of framework. I, I mean, base, basically, what you have is a system for building, building naive compilers mm -hmm. that do a very straightforward translation to a simple abstract machine, or a, you know, or, or a very dumbed down way of using a real machine to basically treat it like an abstract. Mm -hmm. And you know, you can build correct code this way, but you're not going to get performance. This, this is like yeah. the difference between. You know, O zero and O three. Oh yeah. You know, and 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 then, I mean, this whole approach is a, is is a dead end if you want performance. Oh, absolutely. But, but, it's, but it's it's really what's really interesting is how is how nice some of this is done compared to some earlier approaches to the same thing. I mean, you did mention that Omega is actually, you know, the latest in a in a long history of similar things, starting with. Uh, uh, meta and Meta 2 back in the early 60s, Tree Meta around 1970 was kind of an old idea. People tried to write compilers this way and they realized that compilers produce crappy code and, you know, they moved on eventually. But, you know, it's kind of reviving this technique. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's, you know, it's, 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 it's interesting, but you're not going to build highly performant, you know, marketable, you know, commercially successful systems you know, using that kind of yeah, so, it's, it's really fun. Oh, it's, it's really fun. So probably the biggest thing missing that, uh, that modern compilers really take a lot of advantage of is profile guided optimization and global optimizations. Well, yeah, global optimization, not, right. not, not even inter procedural, but just, just global with the yeah. procedure. I, I mean, you're going to have a lot of fun trying to do flow analysis oh. and, and that kind of framework. Oh yeah. 
and, and tracking down errors is hard too. Any, any kind of sophisticated register allocation beyond just the simple sort of, uh, you know, basically it's easy to write a weird style compiler if you're familiar with, you know. I'm not familiar with that one specifically now. Oh, uh, the class weird, you know, the designer of Pascal, module two, okay. so languages, uh, had kind of a, there was a style of compiler that, um, um, all those compilers, you know, that characterize all those compilers that came out of ETH for that series of languages. And, you know, they all were, were fairly naive, but they do a fair amount of very local, um, opportunistic optimization. It's, it's easy to compile a language that was designed to run on a stack based machine. Oh, yeah. Onto yeah. a machine language. For That's stack yeah. Right. Right. Yeah, and, yeah. And he would carefully design his languages to fit the architecture of this mm -hmm. compiler. Oh, yeah. Um, and the hardware was okay. Yeah. And, and they were doing that here too, is that like, let's define the hardware, the language, the intermediate, all the way up through the grammar, you know, the actual full thing to fit it. And they ran into those issues again and again, optimization performance was their, their biggest. Okay. But basically, if they talk to some compiler people, they probably get a heads up on this. For, but, oh. but this, isn't what, this isn't what they were trying. Well, well yeah, and they would blow their line count. <laughs> They, they would so hugely blow their line count on the simplest amounts of optimizations of any kind. I, I mean, it was fairly obvious from what they, what they did that they were much more interested in exploring a mm -hmm. lot of interesting ideas than building the system. I, I would say uh, if, 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 if you want to see a project that actually mm -hmm. was about producing kind of a stripped down, minimal kind of get down to the essence kind of system, uh, Beard's Oberon system is actually a really cool thing to look at. Uh, but you know, I mean, I'd love to hear an Oberon talk. Got up here, <laughs> it's not in that. Oh yeah. Uh, I mean, you know, he, he you know, he, he just wrote another beard style compiler for this thing. It's short and it's fast, but you know, it's not very good. <laughs> so it's a lot longer than yours. <laughs> oh yeah, um, yeah. So. For, for this is, um, they were talking about some of their original plans uh, to alleviate the optimizations by just running it on supercomputers, throwing money at it, FPGAs, custom hardware. Um, in the actual project, they didn't do that. They wanted to run on a laptop, and they spent a lot of their time trying to make it you know, run well on a you know, single core way back when laptops. Well, for them, I guess it was current. If only they lived in the future. Um, but that's that's what they had, and this was sort of at the end of it, what they're left with. And this is my company, and this is the website. It still says coming soon, really, really soon. But from 2019, if you can tell the date, I'm one of these days. Really, I'm going to update it. Probably, maybe. I don't know. Not likely. So. <laughs> Uh, so this goes into a, a slightly different talk of some of the research that's been done since then by, by me and some of my people. And uh, I would say it's highly controversial. So please uh, uh, controvert as, as you like. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> so we tried to do a very similar thing in that, you know, pick up the ball and run with it. But we wanted to optimize, like we really wanted to optimize. That was the really low hanging fruit there. Well, given very low hanging fruit, but it was so beautiful the way that they had done all the other parts. So we're like, okay, well, let's make it so we've got grammars for all these different things, make a bunch of grammars. And, you know, so write anything, you know, run it anywhere, right? It's the, the promise of uh, all the things. And then we're like, no, really, really anywhere. Let's let's make it for arms and this and that and the other, ASICs even, just everywhere. Do it for everything. And, you know, that's really what a universal Turing machine is supposed to be about. You know, it's like you have a bigger machine, you put the little one on it, you've got a Super Nintendo emulator, and life is awesome. I've been trying to, you know, make my Windows machine run on the, you know, Super Nintendo, and it doesn't work. I don't know why one gobbles up the other one just fine. Something about state space, I suppose. But we also really wanted to have this thing called formal verification. 
And I don't know if anybody knows about that at all, formal verification. Anybody have super questions about it? OK. It's a pretty large topic. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, so the, the quickest thing I did want to throw out there is it's super duper impossible for, for the general case of programs. Um, and so we actually looked at what's the specific case where we could do it. And I found out that, uh, well, you can only do formal verifications for programs that, uh, I'll, I'll put on the next slide. But the optimizing part is if you can prove correctness, okay, you can prove correctness, you can do some crazy things with optimization because if you can do, say, source to source, so that's not really correct, uh, tree to tree sort of transformations like they were doing, as you saw earlier, if you can prove correctness along those lines, like you start off with something correct and you know it's still correct on the outside, you can do some crazy stuff in the middle and just reject anything that's not correct because you can sort of have that. But again, you're, you're left with a subset that you can actually do that with. And so we looked at what that subset would be. So history, I don't think we need for us in here. Universal Turing machine, in case somebody doesn't know what it is. That's nobody in here, I'm sure. The halting problem, that's the bug. That's not the bug, the, the, the bug of bear, the thing that makes it so you can't prove correctness, prove optimization, anything else. But it's this one really big part right here is that a Turing machine needs that infinitely long tape or the infinite pile of memory or whatever else you'd want to call it. It's an absolute requirement. Um, but strangely enough, oh, this is XKCD in case anybody likes. I highly recommend it. Um, we're like, okay, well, let's let's do something a little bit different. What if we just had a physically realizable size of tape, or otherwise known as finite? What if we made them finite state machines? As in anything that would be a Turing machine and you just get the scissors out, it's all of a sudden it's finite. And you can prove anything you want about finite state machines. You can prove, you know, them being identical, different, reverse them, inverse them, compose, like the, the madness. Like, you should look up the composition. A, 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 a real computer. Mm -hmm. Everyone. Oh, so I, I would go with it's entirely possible to make a thing while finite where your state space, if you just had, I don't know, just a kilobit, you know, that is way too much state space to really prove, like, it's, you know, Forever and ever. No, no, not. I mean, 256 bits of storage. Yeah, I, I, I would agree with you there. That's that's something that's uh, not a normal tack, and, and certainly limiting it in this way just makes it many times the age of the universe to prove some things that are fairly simple. You know. It's more, this makes it possible. In fact, I would go with, from a, a strictly mathematical standpoint, if it's not possible to make an infinite state machine, you can't make a thing that the halting problem would apply to. Of course, it might take you many, many universe ages to figure that out, but. But, but you, you can take specific programs and prove properties of them. Mm -hmm. what, what you don't have is an algorithm going to be able to, you know, automatically give you an answer. Um, uh, it, it, it is possible, though, to actually construct programming languages which are not sufficiently general to, oh, to, certainly. to introduce non-termination, but which are powerful enough to solve for interesting tasks. Uh, for example, if you're doing three transducers, if, mm -hmm. you, if, you, if you restrict it to structural induction, uh, you know, so that the, the, and, and, and the, the, the rewrites always reduce the size of the tree. Then, then um, you're going to. Guaranteed to yeah. terminate. That's just the yeah. property of the language. Yeah. You find it that way. Yeah. Uh, it's also true that if you, uh, you know, to, you know, to take, uh, um, um, you know, there are certain, there are certain type systems that guarantee termination. And, you know, the simplest ones don't let you write many interesting programs as well. But uh, there are languages that say you know use complicated bowls and mapping 
instead of general recursion and they throw general recursion out of language. And, you know, you can do a lot in those languages. So the programs will turn very there to determine it. But, oh, yeah. So, <laughs> they're not yeah. sort of complete either. Yeah. And anytime you've got. There, there is an interesting class of languages which are not sort of complete, which are useful. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's a bunch. But any. Anytime you throw in recursion, uh, a push down stack, um, string replacement, there's a whole bunch of things that are strictly equivalent to infinite state. Uh, basically, that, that sort of hierarchy of uh, the different kind of automatons, anytime you get above the finite state machines, they're all infinite all the way up from there. They just get really interesting at the Turing level. Recursion is in self reference if one dies or another. Mm -hmm. You know, call it iteration in some cases. Basically, it's, it, practically, that's that's where the non-termination comes from. Oh, yeah. Eliminate that from a language. Yeah. termination. But, you know, but, you lose a tremendous amount of so, power uh, as well. The interesting thing is there are languages that are useful, mm -hmm. though they are not turning. But in, in, a very, in a very sort of simplistic way is if you were to simply get the scissors out and, you know, hack at a Turing machine, just, just chop it off to be finite, you could prove the termination or non-termination of anything on that finite tape. From the standpoint is, any possible set of states on that tape being finite, uh, you could simply simulate it right up until it repeated. And because it's a finite length, it would have to either halt or repeat at some point. That might be forever and ever. Not forever, just the slightly yeah, yeah. trillions well, and that's billions that's and quadrillions. Yeah. No, yeah. I mean, the, the, you know, an actual implementable random access machine is equivalent to a finite state yeah. machine. Mm -hmm. You're not going to exhaust that state space, and well. you're not going to. You, 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 there, there are. You will have to wait out for. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yes, yes. For, so, for a certain non-terminating process. So the the goal here was simply to go from the properly proven to be impossible Turing machines to the, oh my God, this is so many ages of the universe long. But from a mathematical standpoint, you can conceptually say anything that's in this, you can, given enough time of eons and eons, of trillions and, well, trillions is nowhere close to long enough of years. Oh, you need space too, don't get me wrong. You need time and space. But again, for... for Oh yes, for 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 any finite uh, thing, there will be a finite amount of time and space to tell you everything you want to know about it. Oh, yeah. let's go. Oh, I know, I know. If only I had a couple more slides. <laughs> So uh, I just tried to you know, make a little bit of a program language with the slightest modification. Uh, can anybody tell me what the modification is by reading this? Yeah, that's it. That's it. Just, just, just give a certain amount of memory that you're limited to. It's tiny. So it says, just pick a size, any size, doesn't really matter. Just pick a size. I mean, it doesn't matter if it's gigabytes, terabytes, petabytes, just some size. And all of a sudden, what is an otherwise turn complete language will happily do its thing. And mind you, this is what happens when you go to the store, by the way, right? You pick the size of the not Turing machine thing that you're going to run all your Turing complete languages on. Sure. <laughs> Pretty much. No, I'll happily grant you that. Oh yeah. Okay. Okay. I'm, I'm happy. To me, how you get compared to a business model? Oh, okay. <laughs> sure. 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 So this is uh, this this first line up here is something I would contend uh, that it's not me saying it's it's a general thing of um, if you take a finite state machine that is ugly in this sort of way and you take a different one that's ugly in this sort of way and you optimize them and by that just means 
remove all the dead states, all that first sort of stuff. Optimizing finite state machines is a super normal thing that people have been doing long since before I was born. Um, if they are indeed the same thing, they will be identical once optimized, no matter how weird and ugly they were to begin with. You can have as many extra dead, whatever, wasted states as you want, but they're identical if they're, if they're optimized, if, if they're the same. And if they're different once they're optimized, then they're different. It's super easy to prove sameness or not. But it makes it impossible to hide some things, and uh, this is something I've come up along a few times is that the final product may be quite incomprehensible. It's brief. It's the briefest it can be. Um, sometimes it's super easy to understand. And I'll get to that. So I, I made some patents along these lines, and um, you don't read them if you're not allowed to read patents, OK? No, no I've come up. Oh, uh, yeah. So. In the space of finite state machine, if oh, yeah, if for the restricted model, so yeah, 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 it's a, it's a I'd say it's a given from long before I was born. They they did finite state machines have been around for freaking decades and decades before I was born. Uh, making showing whether or not they're equivalent. Um, they're, they're reducible to a, a similar one, or the same one, in fact, if they're identical. Um, so you could have one that's like 100 states, it's all weird in this way, and 50 states, it's all weird in this way. When you optimize them both, maybe they're the same 10 states. Well, finite state machines always, so finite state machines, um, the word always terminates not right, but they go for as many of the inputs as there are. In the, yeah. Oh yeah, th that algorithm, yeah, that algorithm always terminates. And, and there's a strict bounds on how long it takes for the number of states. Um, there's some really nice ones with, uh, probably that kind of thing is a, uh, crap, well, my favorite one is the double reversal, which it's, yeah. I, I would encourage you to look up, it is awesome to read. Um, but don't read that if you can't. We, we did some of this stuff. And mind you, application-wise, just the way that we did it, you'll notice there's an awful lot of similarity to the way that they did stuff in uh, in their star stuff. Is parsing expression grammars, uh, input codes, abstract syntax machine, um, and, and, and finite state machines. And uh, the one on the left is just language to language translation with optimization in between. And the one on the right is language to uh, hardware. Um, these are obviously very, very abstract. I could go into them a little bit more, but you should notice some similarities, I assume. What we've turned it into is these things. And they work really, really well. In fact, we're dealing in spaces where we know we want something to terminate. A lot of times it's uh, you know data passing, networking, uh, talking to SSDs, PCI Express, all that sort of stuff. These are the things that we turn it into that you're interested in, Ron. Did you have any specific questions? Uh, no. Um, if this is true, it's really cool. I'm a little skeptical at this point. Oh, no, no. I, 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 I very much appreciate skepticality. Well, I'm programmed to do this. Because look at some of these domains. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there are things in a DSL, which is expressing a finite state machine. Yeah. And if your program can be expressed as a, directly as a finite state machine, mm -hmm. that's how you're coding it yeah. rather than rather than just relying on this, you know, sort of theoretical construction that a <laughs> that a finite a finite tape is. Well, yes. so um, um, what happens if, if you're writing if you're writing the machine explicitly, mm -hmm. you're writing out mistakes. Oh God, no! And so we, we don't do that. So all of our stuff is um, so parsing expression grammars in the space we use them are equivalent to finite state transducers is what they turn into. Um, and so for these is for the say HTTPS, uh, there is a part in there that does the math, and that's you know sort of separate to it. And it's constructed uh, 
uh, as just like pure combinatorial logic with pipelining. Uh, the stuff for HTTP, there's an actual grammar for that. And grammars have this bad habit of allowing you to have basically infinitely long things just wherever the hell you want them. And you start putting some constraints on that and you can translate it directly into a finite state transducer. DNS is the blessedly simple, it's just some headers and you just respond. Um, the BGP stuff, we, well. Well, BGP has some code examples of programs written in this language. That's, that's kind of like. The code examples look surprisingly the same as the ones that we saw earlier and that are in the appendixes of the steps things. Oh, the output's fair a lot. Well, VHDL, because I like that better. But yeah. I, so don't judge me. I like VHDL. It's more, it's. Well, I'm surprised that you're actually compiling the hardware. Of course. And, and, and most of the things we actually do, uh, so I, I like the Xilinx things. I don't know, you get hooked on something when you're young, you know. And um, I actually use the, they have lookup table primitives and they have register primitives. And I actually just output to primitives. And so I actually could just uh, output to the EDIF things instead of the VHDL in, in, in the intermediary. And so we don't use the VHDL for its synthesis things. It actually outputs what's effectively pre-synthesized VHDL. And uh, we kind of like to place things ourselves too, because I mean, you know. Uh, Oh, uh, does anybody have a good answer for that? It is. It's distributed denial of service attacks. Um, so uh, packets come in at hundreds of gigabits per second to the FPGAs, and there's a thing called Berkeley Packet Filter, uh, BPF, that is built into Linux. And everybody super duper loves it, and it's used on a bunch of things we made uh, little uh, CPUs that natively understand the binary of BPF that run in the FPGAs and filter the packets as they come through. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, my, my thing here is if, 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 the, if the language, if your program mm -hmm. is essentially a phonics you know, it, 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 it is some, yeah. some, you know, language that maps to a phonics station yeah. as its underlying abstract mm -hmm. machine, then that the, then all this works. Uh, but it's 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 very I think it'd be very interesting to see that language. I guess because I'm a language guy. Oh yeah, yeah. So it's it's all domain specific languages and grammars to it's literally it, all these things that, that are in the same things that uh, the steps okay. because those early yeah. examples we mm -hmm. saw with Ometa, mm -hmm. I, I mean you, you can I mean you can certainly do something in that framework, but you know, those examples were not producing product extension. Oh no, no. So, so this, this is interesting. I'm interested in seeing okay. some, yeah. some samples. I'm interested in your language. Okay, yeah. Yeah. we can we can do that sometime. <laughs> A lot of them. And that's what happens. Yeah. Well, I I, I would only answer that in the weirdest sort of way in that you can't make something that's not a finite state machine in this universe. Uh, okay. Which is the worst way of saying. It's, it, yeah, it's, it's, it's a very much non-answer. Um, the, the truth of it is that it's quite easy to make machines that are too large to verify in any uh, human reasonable or even in fact you know, say Star Trek Foundation or, or you know, Q level reasonable, like a Q would have a difficult, man, I need to make some more universes. And it, yeah, there's, you get there quickly. Oh, the. But there, but there are many languages in which you can write programs mm -hmm. that are verified. Oh, yeah. There, yeah. there are type systems mm -hmm. where the types essentially are correct as proof. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and your, if, you're, if the type of your program, you know, if your program type checks, you know, it's it's. You've got some guarantees. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, yeah. You, you, you've got and, a specification. And, this is what this is what it does. And, and so for and the it's a practical programming language, this is all the research topic. Oh yeah, it's it's a lot of stuff they make for research uh, uh, things. Um, for for this is, if if you were to write something in a given language and it and your program sort of demanded as part of it, 
that it had an access to infinite memory. I mean, most people call that a memory leak, but hey, look, there's legitimate things. Like, have I ever seen this, you know, cat picture before while I'm looking on the internet? And you let that run forever, that's an infinite state machine because you there's always going to be more cats on the internet forever. <laughs> hey, hey, well, you know, universe is going to, you know, at some point go do something that's uncomfortable for us. I don't know. I'm just guessing. Um, it's infinite. Oh yeah. Nothing limits it. No. And you'll 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 get you know too much stack uh, recursion. You'll get ran out of memory. JavaScript will say you know broken face things. But in the general, there's uh, there's many many kinds of programs that trying to do this to would be quite unpleasant for, um, to say the least. Um, but from the strictly mathematical standpoint, we can certainly imagine, you know, computers the size of a planet that at some point would make some of those programs more likely to be able to have this treatment. Um, for, for us, is we use the treatment in, in ways that uh, all of these, if you, you would, uh, you know, grant me, they take something in, in a given amount of time, are expected to put something back out. They're, they're built off of the notion that it definitely has to be terminating and probably pretty quickly. And so that limits, you know, just the actual runtime, uh, let alone the actual amount of state that you want to hold for these. And so it's a reasonable thing to do, but there's plenty of unreasonable programs. But it's mathematically possible. That's all I'm saying. Eh. You know, design for your audience. <laughs> this is not the right audience for some things. Um, This is some of my final thoughts. And, and mind you, I'm speaking in general. At some point, the hardware is going to have to catch up. That summarizes some of the things I was saying. Th this part is actually the most interesting to me. And it's so if, if you were to write, the the interview question sort algorithm right and you were to do something just awful and say hey incoming list i'm just going to shuffle you and if you're in order i'll return it otherwise we're going to shuffle that thing again and again and again and again and factorial times if you let me i mean random shuffle so it's probabilistic at that it's awful um but if you put something like that in here it would replace that algorithm, data structure, whatever it might be. When you actually go to implement it, it would make you something that's not only reasonable, but the best possible implementation. Um, when you get to bigger and bigger sort of things, there's all sort of times when you're going to run into algorithms and data structures that are just, while they look really awesome, uh, they don't take into account a lot of things like cache hierarchy and, and memory latency and all these sort of, sort of things. This can address that, but again, you may end up spending more energy than the universe has, longer than the universe will live, and more matter than Q could invent for some things like that. However, it takes the, the one step of halting problem is an impossible thing to it's impossible to have the halting problem be an impossible thing. And I don't know if that makes life any better. It's just super impractical for some problems, but not impossible. I don't know if that's better. Well, I mean, this, this, is, this is, you know, fairly well known. Yeah, but, yeah. But, you know, theoreticians frequently use these, these models with the infinities because you know, as an abstraction for reasoning about the programs, you know, they're, they're perfectly fine. Mm -hmm. I mean, for, for problems of realistic size, uh, treating a, a computer as a general purpose computer as a fine state machine. It's is painful. Completely impractical. Oh, yeah. Uh, for one thing, this optimization. Yes, this optimization requires you to enumerate states. Mm -hmm. There are too many houses. It's a lot. And very quickly you get into problems where, you know, it's like 
you know, we don't even think the universe is big enough to hold. Oh, very quickly. A computer that can run these algorithms. Indeed, indeed. So, so, so you know, you know infinities are easier to deal with than some very large finite number <laughs> in mathematics. So that's just lazy. What's the numbers on how many states you could enumerate if every subatomic particle in the universe? Was a computer mm -hmm. with a clock time of Planck constant, yada, yada, yada. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The number turns out to be shockingly small. It's a couple of hundred bits worth is the yeah, most yeah, yeah. you can possibly do. I would accept that. So um, you, you can't even buy a device that has a memory that small. No, anymore. not really. Something of 128 bit would be way so too much. The observation that, yes, in theory, if you can put a bound on something, that in, then in principle, you, you can now compute all these things. Mm -hmm. and then, are not turning computable. Um, that observation in and of itself strikes me as fairly useless. Oh, it's, and it's... yet you claim to be doing all the useful things. <laughs> and so you must have gotten there. You must have done something else. Well, that's what I'm trying to be finding out is what is it that you actually did to do the crux of the stuff? Does that even <laughs> I have to believe state space is just small, but it's problems. So, there's, 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 uh, shall we say, a little bit extra secret sauce. We did make it to the questions, <laughs> and uh, I can, uh, I can share a little bit more about that. Uh, suffice it to say, um, it does indeed work, and merely that it's possible is the important part. Um, the, the, the how to is actually really, really fun. So. Big state machines are awful. And mind you, you don't need to have that big before it's quite awful. Did you know that you can break them apart into little ones? And there's recursive methods of doing that. And did you know if you compose one state machine with another, sometimes the combined is exponentially bigger, sometimes they're smaller. And there's ways to actually combine them in such a way that you nicely, neatly sidestep entirely almost all of those state states explosions quite quickly. Okay, so the answer to my question is you're taking advantage of the structure of the kinds of problems that Yeah. And, and, and so the joke of it is, is remember how I said is, is, at least from a mathematical standpoint, you can optimize anything. And it throws away the data structures and algorithms. Well, that thing that does the optimization, what's the first thing I optimized? <laughs> and I throw things in there, and it walks through them in such a way for the things that I've used it for, and mind you, I haven't used it to do something silly, um, is tends to be a, less than a second. I, I actually haven't had it run on anything it took as long as a minute. Um, so, mm, it works? Okay. Yeah, yeah. But it has everything in it necessary to describe it in a way that shows that it's possible is my point. And, uh, I don't know, I'm always looking for people who would like to do additional research uh, and, and help me with some of these things. The reason that we actually made the patents was simply to publish the, the research um, because we're lazy and we don't like peer review. Well, I, just, I worked at a university too long to actually like peer review. Um, but these are more just for that purpose. Uh, I doubt that there's anybody in the whole entire world that ever gets to the point of trying to infringe on them. If they did, they'd get a hug and a pile of cash because that's awesome <laughs> but no nobody would ever infringe on it. i can't imagine it would be weird uh yeah um and i did want to say one of the things that we're working on the software find radio we found some amazing things so we put in uh quantum electrodynamics instead and it made some amazingly amazing things and uh that's what's actually taking all my time for research and development right now, is properly amazing things, like entirely too amazing. FPGAs. Oh, no, no. Uh, just normal FPGAs, the, the Xilinx kind, because they're pretty cool. Not not a plug, not sponsored. Cause... Although, it'd be nice to get a sponsorship. Um, I'm past my time. Does anybody have anything else? Or just break up into groups and cut the talk? Yeah. Okay. Uh, 
Yes, uh, thank you, Daniel, for an interesting talk about VPRI. And, 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 and,